Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for Open Source, Not the Same Old Conversation. Please welcome Ensa Foundation President Suzanne Wilson Heckenberg. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for Ensa's 2022 The Future of the IC Workforce webinar. We held several of these last year, and we're delighted with the help of Advantage Federal that we can bring this conversation back to you today. I would like to point out that this conversation is on the record and there will be media present. But today's program is focused on open source, not the same old conversation. But before we begin, I also wanna let you know that we would welcome your questions. I encourage you to submit them in the Q&A box on the right side of your screen. And our moderator today will do his best to get to them. I'd also like to thank our supporting partner, Clearance Job, for their support of today's program. Now, this is also an opportunity to introduce our moderator, a long-standing friend of ENSA's and the ENSA Foundation, and also a member of our Board of Trustees, Matt Scott. Matt is also the co-founder and Senior Vice President of Mission Tech Solutions, an Advantage Federal company. An Army intelligence veteran, his expertise includes delivering and scaling emerging technologies and data-driven mission capabilities for the IC. And previously, Matt held different leadership roles with a variety of consulting firms. He is a voice for change in how the intelligence community leverages technology, open source, as well as the workforce. Now, it is my pleasure to turn things over to Matt Scott. Matt? Thank you so much, Suzanne, uh, and thank you to the staff and volunteers at INSA and INSA who work uh, to make these events happen, because there really aren't many, if any, other forums dedicated to the study of intelligence. Uh, the mission at INSA is threefold, uh, to broaden and deepen our understanding of intelligence issues, to facilitate discourse, public discourse, on the role of intelligence for our nation's security, and to advocate uh, for the intelligence workforce. And that is exactly uh, what we're going to do here today in just a few moments on the topic of open source. We also promised in the title of this event that we, it would not be the same old conversation that you've heard before. And by that, I think we meant a couple of things. And then we're not going to start by relitigating uh, definitions of what open source is and isn't. We're not going to talk about the, how overwhelming the volume and the variety and the velocity of the data are. Uh, and we're not going to scapegoat cultures uh, for not adopting OSINT yet, and we're not going to try and convince the old guard again uh, that OSINT is somehow complements their legacy ints and is therefore not a threat to them. Uh, these were all interesting conversations over the last 10 or 15 years, uh, but to get anywhere, at some point, you've got to just move out, and that's what we're going to attempt to start to do uh, this afternoon. I'm Matt Scott. It's, it's my real pleasure to introduce our two speakers today. Uh, the Honorable Ellen McCarthy, President of Truth and Media Cooperative, and Patrice Tibbs, Deputy Chief of Community Functional Management at CIA. And with that, uh, we're going to jump right in. We're going to start with a question from an attendee. And the question is this, uh, with the abundance of publicly available information available to senior decision makers, what distinguishes OSINT and how does OSINT offer value? Uh, that comes from Ori Share at the Joint Information Operations Warfare Center. Uh, Patrice, we're going to start with you. Uh, again, you are the Deputy Chief of Community Functional Management at CIA. You have this incredible multidisciplinary background, including some very successful open source cloud computing efforts under your belt. You've got a reputation for leaning forward, for exploring new um, ways of doing things. Uh, and then you also have you know, a career in the private sector and as a Navy Reservist. Um, would you both tell us a bit about yourself? and then respond to Ori's question on the value of open source. So again, I'm Patrice Tibbs, current Deputy Chief of Community Functional Management, supporting the open source enterprise. Um, I have, as Matt said, a varied and broad experience base from military. Well, first I'll start. I'm the oldest of six kids, so I learned how to plan and manage people very, very early in life. Um, I have uh, been an enlisted and transitioned to officer. I was a contractor for over 20 years and transitioned to federal government staff. Um, I was um, also a, a very high level and supportive um, 
mission partner with all of the different areas of the IC. My current role is very much focused on trying to share and collaborate at every level. Um, this particular role is uh, very uh, important to me because it really gives me the opportunity to use all of those skill sets I've gathered and, and um, honed and, and trained on over these years to try to get everybody as much as possible, as much as you can get the federal government on one page, uh, on the same page to share. Um, from the value, uh, re related to the value of open source, open source to me, and especially in our current environment in world events has proven itself over and over and over. As Matt said, um, we've litigated definitions in different uh, areas of what open source is, but when you look at the landscape and the demand and how it's increasing and how we now communicate, that really is the lion's share of where information is coming from. My five-year-old grandson understands the value of the, the, the iPhone and, and, and communicating, and if we can't get on board and figure that kind of thing out now and understand how that is leveraged can be leveraged to make sure that we are clear in every country, every city, every home in, in some cases, we will lose the lion's share of any benefit we have in open source. Thanks. Ellen, uh, you've led multiple organizations in our community, uh, including really interestingly, I think in places where the teams specialize in OSINT without a necessity, but also because of the impact they've been able to achieve. You've led Coast Guard Intelligence, State Department uh, Intelligence as the Assistant Secretary of State. Um, you've also had leadership roles across the industry. Uh, would you both tell us a bit about yourself and then give us a slightly different take on Ori's question. Um, what to you, not just is the value, but what's the potential of open source? Um, so thank you, Matt. Thanks, Patrice. Thanks, Insef. Thank you, everybody, for um, inviting me here today. Um, this is this is my favorite subject and the sub subject I'm probably most passionate about. Um, like Matt said, I've been doing this for a while. I think what sets me apart from some of my counterparts is that I have pretty much supported most of the customers in the national security sector. So be they policymakers, law enforcement officials, and defense warfighters. Um, and that's that's kind of unique, and it's not only from the perspective of as an all source analyst sharing information with those customers, but very much on the business side as well. You know, working budget and acquisition, um, working uh, um, collections, and I've been in and out. Um, I uh, worked at Insa for a period, and then I also um, ran a for profit company that was a subsidiary to a non profit Noblis, which gave me an incredible perspective of. Um, you know, not only how the community works, but how the private sector works with the community. So, you know, I'm never going to say I've, I've done it all, but I think I've gotten a fair taste of all that um, the intelligence community is and can be. And to your point, Matt, um, the jobs that I always found to be the most fun and the most engaging were the ones where we were most closely aligned with the private sector. It tended to be the smaller intel organizations, INR, Coast Guard, um, small because they were very closely connected with their customer, which meant they had, you know, very, very collaborative relationship. They were small, so they'd have to leverage others. They'd have to leverage everything to be able to do what it is they needed to do. And, and I found those to be the most, and even NGA, where, you know, commercial imagery was, um, for my time, when, uh, when pretty much national technical means, when I started, was the only game in town to, you know, the last 10 years where the commercial sector has just exploded in terms of um, small sat capabilities and um, tools that can help assess um, commercial capabilities. So it's, it's just been such an exciting time. The value of OSINT and the potential for OSINT, you know, I. I know we're not allowed to talk about, you know, definitions and what OSINT is. I hate the word OSINT because I think there's so much sort of bad baggage that's attached to it. But, um, but I'll tell you that it is everything. I mean, it's everything in government. It's everything in the private sector. And, you know, and so whether you're in government and it's an it's an opportunity to leverage openly available information sources so that you can now use finite dollars to 
focus on investments and capabilities that aren't don't exist in the private sector. So it just seems like an incredible business model in the private sector. Businesses um, can leverage open source in information to help manage risk, to help with cyber, to um, work insider threat. And, and for individuals, I mean, you look, you know, 90% of the world's data today has been generated in the last two years. I mean, as individuals, we have more access to insights and, and information and support. We are richer than we've ever been before. And that's all wonderful, but it's also scary at the same time because it's also a petri dish for bad stuff to happen in terms of other countries trying trying to mess with us. But again, but, but again getting back to your, your question about what is the potential, I mean, I, I think that there, I mean, I, my answer would be that I just think there's so much that the intelligence community can do with publicly available information um, that will make the analysts' day easier, which will actually help us focus resources on things that the private sector can't do for us. I mean, I think the world is our oyster. It's so true. And I mean, Analyst jobs haven't gotten any easier over the last couple of years. And, and actually, I think before we go deeper, uh, maybe we set the table a bit more with context around the current moment in the intelligence community. And what I mean by that is writ large, how are we doing? Um, and to do that, I actually want to read, Ellen, I'll read you an excerpt from a recent interview with Amy Ziegart, uh, the author of Spies, Lies, and Algorithms. For those of you in the audience, this book is making its uh, it's way around the community right now. Um, and Ellen, I want to ask for your reaction. And here's a, here's a quote from, uh, from Ziegart. She says, today we face a critical junction for American spy agencies as big as 9-11. Only most people don't know it. New dangers come from technology, not terrorists. Emerging technologies like AI and social media are weakening the strong and empowering the weak, fundamentally changing dynamics of international conflict. To be blunt, the U.S. is losing its intelligence advantage. Ellen, what's your reaction to that statement? So this is where I am the benefit of no longer being in government, so I can say what I want. Sorry, Patrice. Um, all right. I, I mean, I have to say I, I agree a hundred percent. You know, and you know, the funny thing is, is that you look at countries like China right now, where they have our computing power. Um, I mean, we're now, they, they now have matched us in terms of, terms of computational capabilities, but they just have access to so much more data than we do. I mean, because, you know, they can create their own internet, they can spy on their own people. So they, you know, to take Amy's point, mm -hmm. they have the computational capabilities, they have the data, they can now train, and, you know, they can now get better and better and better. And we just are, you know, we're, our challenges are that we are, you know, we've got the constitution and we have laws and we have policies and it's just making it difficult for us to keep up. But I'm an optimist. So I actually think that there is hope that we don't have to create our own internet. We don't have to um, um, spy on Americans to, to, to gain in capabilities, but it, it's gonna take incredible leadership. I mean, it's gonna take continued leadership, continued focus, we're going to have to make some hard decisions. Matt, you and I wrote an article nine months ago called We Need Another Wild Bill Moment. And just to expand on that point, um, you know, working to, towards World War II, you know, in 1941, Roosevelt was worried that he wasn't getting the strategic perspective that he needed as he was going, if he was going to take his country into war. Germany had launched an incredibly effective propaganda campaign. This just sound pretty familiar to some of us in this audience where misinformation and disinformation is now the, now the norm. He, he brought on Wild Bill Donovan, who I know most of our, our, most of our audience here has heard of before, because Wild Bill is not only incredibly brave, but he had traveled the world. He gained access to sources, publicly available sources, leaders, that gave him amazing insights into what was going on. And so Roosevelt made him the chief of information. I feel like we're kind of at this point right now. Roosevelt brought in somebody whose job was going to be the chief of information. And of course, out of that was born the OSS. And I mean, not only was the OSS's um, success, I mean, they certainly had operational success, but I would argue the OSS's biggest success was the change in the way we did business across government. We created the Central Intelligence Agency. We created the Bureau of INR. We created special forces. 
I feel like we're at this another juncture like that. We need another Wild Bill Donovan. The difference is the Wild Bill Donovan may not have to be a government Wild Bill Donovan. It could be a private sector Wild Bill Donovan that actually, you know, pr you know, maybe Matt, you're the next Wild Bill Donovan, you know, that, that brings together, you know, all these entities to say, this is the way we need to operate. But I think, I think sustained leadership is probably the thing we need the most right now. Yeah, I, I would, I mean, I am an optimist too. I'm an optimist uh, because I think, you know, some of those challenges you listed, Ellen, you know, our constitution, our values, innovation, those are also our strengths. And if we can find that leadership and we can find uh, a structure to apply it through, uh, we can accomplish whatever we want to accomplish. Uh, Patrice, uh, Zegart, uh, Amy Zegart goes on to say in her book, uh, the number one recommendation actually, because I think she also is a bit of an optimist, that her number one recommendation for the intelligence community to gain or regain its intelligence advantage is to focus on open source. Uh, Patrice, what's your reaction to that recommendation? I 100% agree. Um, as we evolve and change and look at what we need to do to um, make op open source more valuable uh, than it already is, it is becoming what you know most of us call now the end of first resort. It really is that opportunity um, that we're finding across every level, every time something happens, every incident, every issue has been uh, validated or either even uh, come to, um, to our attention through open source. Um, mm -hmm. Open source is just one of those areas where we, we are diving deep now and the technology and all the pieces that pull that together, the AIs, the machine learning, the uh, translation, all those areas are starting to get more and more refined. And I believe, I, I agree with Ellen that we have to continue to um, drive from either, a, not only the leadership perspective, but also the, just understand that we can't just continue to sit back and wait for it to happen. We have to kind of lean forward. And I, I am an optimist as well. I always look for that opportunity to be creative and find that new way of doing things. And that is one of the things I'm hopeful of, that there is a recognition, at least from what I'm seeing recently, that the value of open source is just bringing um, a new perspective, um, not just in just the, your tra your traditional uh, intelligence, but also in how we do intelligence in general. Um, it it just totally is changing the landscape, and I'm I'm really excited about those opportunities coming. Well, let's I mean let's talk about that, and let's finish setting the context maybe for our discussion here. Um, Ellen, you moderated a panel uh, on OSINT people and culture uh, back in August uh, at the INSTA Symposium, and you spoke a bit uh, during that panel about the momentum or the moment OSINT is in right now. Uh, so I, my question to you is, are we still in that moment? Are we gaining or losing speed, um, and are we headed in the right direction? So, I, so Matt, of course we're still in that moment. I mean, and, and I'll tell you that <laughs> Again, it, you know, the question is, are we keeping up on the government side? I mean, I would portend that no. I think the, I think the IC has not kept up with the digital age for a whole host of reasons, which I'm not allowed to talk about because this is a different conversation. But we all know what they are. Um, mm -hmm. But you look what's going on in the private sector. Again, I highlighted that 90% of the world's data was generated in the last two years. That number mm -hmm. is increasing at, at increasing rates. I mean, we. You know, it's it's because we've just got so many different sources of data right now, and and I and well, we haven't even counted the metaverse yet. You know, the whole virtual world, which we're moving into in the next seven years. I just had lunch with a, a friend of ours who said, you know, tell me what the intelligence community is going to look like in the metaverse, and I just sort of went, uh, you know, that you know, the metaverse is the wild west, <laughs> you know, wild Bill Donovan, you know, and that's that's going to add a whole new layer of data upon which 
you know, the private sector is already focusing on in terms of developing tools and, and coming up with ways to process this data and work with this data. Again, um, now that I'm out in the private sector and I've had a chance to see what's going on, I'm so, it's amazing the, the innovation that's going on with automation of, of everything. And, and, and then I just think about my time at INR last year, which by far was my favorite job in, in, the, gov in the government, and, and, and the things that the government needs to do to be able to incorporate those sorts of capabilities. And, you know, what's so ironic about all of this is that everybody says that open source should be the cornerstone of, of everything the IC does. Mm -hmm. The DNI, when she was doing a CSRS report, said it. Congress in the 2001 Authorization Act said, DNI, let's do another study. Um, you know, we've got the bi bipartisan support in Congress. We've got, I mean, everybody is saying open source should be the cornerstone of what we're doing. And yet, you know, Patrice, I don't want to, I don't want to, um, I mean, it just feels like, again, I'm not in, you are in, but it just still feels like it's something that's on the side. It's a sideshow. It's not the cornerstone. And the things that we need to do, moving money, training people, um, you know, actually having consistent, very senior level leadership. Uh, and, and, and it has to apply to all 18 agencies in the IC, which I will tell you, based on my time in INR, is not always the way things work. Having been the head of a little, you know, that the, the big five or six agencies, of course, that's where we put our focus first. And then mm -hmm. the others are supposed to drag along behind. This is, this needs to be we need to have consistent leadership focused on the entire IC enterprise. And I just, I just don't think this sort of happenstance step-by-step -step approach is going to do it. Well, that, I will say, yeah. okay. No, go ahead. No, I will say, I will say that in my current role and I've been in my current role about six months, six months. Um, but I will say what, what I'm seeing is that there is, like we said, an understanding of the value. Um, I'm a Navy retired Navy person. I'll use the turning the carrier analogy. Um, we are getting to, we're beginning to see that sea change. It is federal government slow. Um, however, I really, it, I'm starting to see some momentum at the senior levels, at looking at it from the holistic perspective. My role as community functional management um, is to look at that consistency, some standards and trade craft and training, looking at trying to get all 18 organizations to come together on what are the right data sources? What are the things that should be consistent and baseline across all of open source and what folks should be doing if they're doing open source uh, trade craft? And what are some of the things that collectively we should be looking at in the broader sense of open source um, as a organiza intelligence organizations, um, plural? And so again, you know, my optimistic kind of ray of hope here is that the, 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 the carrier is starting to turn. It, it, it hasn't made that full loop yet, but uh, I am very optimistic just based on what I'm seeing that we are starting to get the momentum in that direction. That's, that's so good to hear. Let's, let's do this. We're gonna engage uh, the audience uh, a couple times throughout this video cast. We're going to do four poll questions, the first of which I want to pull up uh, right now. Uh, we'll ask the audience to respond and then we'll uh, look at the responses uh, once they get uh, tabulated. The first question is to the audience, what grade would you give the IC's current OSINT capabilities? Uh, and oh, I, I, I see the organizers, the organizers took off F, which I wanted on here, but that's okay. A, B, C, <laughs> or D. <laughs> And while that uh, tabulates and folks enter in their answers, Patrice, I, I do want to go back to you. Um, and you started just getting at it with your uh, last remarks. You have this just incredible and, and quite frankly, very rare view uh, into the open source community from where you sit in your current role. What are you seeing in terms of uh, the different applications of OSINT today? What are the current ways our community is creating and using OSINT? I, I believe that 
it's not being used any different than industry in big picture. Um, we do, uh, again, look at open source in a variety of ways, anything that's out there um, that would benefit our mission. Um, from the intelligence perspective, we figure out a way to get um, access to it. However, the, the key for me is just understanding how we modify and change and adapt to the amounts of data that's available. And because there's not a consistency of how um, all of the different 18 organizations are utilizing or capturing or are integrating um, uh, open source into their uh, workflows, there is inconsistency sometimes in how that is translated and shared and a variety of other things. So um, I, 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 I'm hopeful again that we look at different ways to share because I want to make sure that we are taking advantage of uh, what's out there. I can't go into a lot of detail, of course, about exactly what we do, but the bottom line is that the goal is to have some consistency across um, all of the various Intel organizations. And to do that collection, what we collect, what types of data sources we share, and how we do that in a way that is beneficial to the intelligence mission is really the key. Okay. Ellen, let's keep going. Uh, I want to go back to your reference of the CSIS reports. Uh, we've spoken about them a couple of times now. One was a little bit of a, you know, it's, it's, as far as bombshells go in the IC, uh, figurative bombshells, one in 2021, um, maintaining the intelligence edge was was interesting, right? Um, and in, a way, in many ways uh, aligns with Amy Zegart's thinking. Um, and then even more recently, uh, just a couple months ago, uh, CSIS came out with a second report called Move Over Jarvis Meet Oscar. Um, and that was uh, authored by Emily Harding. Um, both reports highlight uh, in particular the challenges um, Patrice is starting to speak to associated with just keeping up with technology with data, um, which then holds us back from achieving the potential of open source. Um, Ellen, if, if we go back to your you know, description of what we could achieve, um, if we're not achieving that today, why is that? Well, I, you know, it's so Patrice highlighted the technical challenges, but I mean, there's all, there's all the other challenges. I mean, so let's, you know, so some members of Congress are legitimately worried about privacy issues and that, you know, so just getting to the data that Patrice is talking about, how can we ensure that data we acquire is not providing insights into US person information? But I mean, it's, it's, it's things like, I, I think our organizational construct still is sort of bifurcated and how OSINT is looked at and treated. So how the army looks at OSINT, how DIA, which is now the lead for all defense intelligence, and then Patrice, sort of her world of work on all of this. And so it, it just, again, it, it just seems to be that we have this bifurcated organizational structure. Funding needs to be reallocated. Moving funding is not easy. Moving funding between departments is not easy. You know, oversight's role in all of this is crazy. Moving a dollar from defense to state is just, it, it, it's, we don't have the agility in moving money around, even the DNI, to actually make these things happen. Um, how do you train your workforce? We're not allowed to talk about cultural issues. Um, um, and, and again, it gets, but it really is a cultural issue. I, I have to highlight, I have to highlight INR. You know, I, I, so the Bureau of Intelligence and Research. You know, I always thought the reason that I loved INR so much was because they, I think they most closely. Um, look like how I think the IC should look. So they are their analysts are integrated with their customers. So they have this customer relationship. They see them every day. Um, foreign service transitions in and out of INR. So you're constantly getting this refresh of what's wanted at embassies, what's wanted at missions. You know, you're, you're, the, the INR is meeting with the secretary and his leadership team every day. They know where policy is going. 
Sometimes they're actually in a room as policy is being developed and having that insight is so valuable. For the most part, they're very comfortable with open source information. Cables are all based on unclassified publicly available data. They're derived from publicly available data. And at the heart of it, INR is researchers. They were the research and analysis branch at the OSS. So from a cultural perspective, they're very comfortable starting their day with unclassified information. Their challenge gets to be in the systems. It gets to, you know, they, they, they just, they, they, they operate on an IC architecture and yet the way their products need to be disseminated is not the same thing. You know, so, so the State Department needs to get their information at the unclassified, maybe secret, secret level. And so the process of moving, <laughs> they're writing at the unclassified level on a high side and they have to figure out how to move it down, which is just, just, it's just nutty. And I always thought, you know, so you have an, you have this Intel element that doesn't have the cultural issues and their architecture is like circa Mad Men. So let's look at, at investing and in, let's, let's look at INR as a place to start. You know, they, 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 the diplomatic mission and the importance of the diplomatic mission is highlighted in the president's national security strategy, the interim strategy. He wants to focus more on diplomacy. That's very, that's seen by, you know, Bill Burns, former ambassador as the head of CIA. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so let's invest in the diplomat, in the diplomacy side. Let's start there. And um, that's just not, that's just not happened yet. But I, I always thought, wouldn't that be the way to go? Um, I, I'll never forget, I asked an analyst once, how, what would be your perfect day? And his answer was, my perfect day would be, first, I got to walk my dog, take care of my baby, exercise, come into work at nine o'clock, and I have a visual of what I should be looking at. And it highlights where I should put some focus. Mm. That is all publicly available information. That capability exists today. So let's start with trusted information sources, and let's start at a place like INR and, and, and build a parallel path so you're not completely breaking with how the IC is operating, but you're building on this on the second track. I, I I always thought that would be the way to go. Love it. I love it. Let's flash up uh, the responses to the first poll question. Um, and while we do that, let's see what the answers are. Okay, C. So 58% of respondents uh, gave uh, the community a C, which is which is passing, as some of my mm -hmm. friends in college probably. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, uh, Ellen started talking about the structure of our open source community, as well as the structure of the intelligence community. Um, can you describe for us just how the National Open Source Committee and the Functional Manager for Open Source are set up um, and how we as a community address problems today? So, from our perspective, from from the kind of or way it's set up today, the open source um, community functional manager is Director Burns of the CIA. He is responsible for um, directly responding to and reporting to the Director of National Intelligence on all areas of open source. Those are the day-to-day. -day um, caring feeding of uh, open source uh, requirements, resources, um, trading and trade crafts and standards um, fall to the director of open source enterprise. And then we directly support that organization and um, manage the entire governance structure on behalf of the open source uh, community. That includes a board of governors, which includes the uh, all of the heads of every all of the 18 organizations, director of CIA, director of NSA, director of, of NRO, and all of the 18 organizations, all of the um, military services, DIA, everybody, NGA. And then um, the next level down is the National Open Source Committee, which uh, the members of that particular uh, board uh, come from the open source leaders, the senior open source uh, practitioners um, of every IC organization. And then we have the subcommittees that focus on data, uh, data acquisition, we have a collection management, and we have a training and tradecraft sub subcommittee. And those boards and subcommittees um, feed up and through to the director to help 
help him manage and uh, lead all of the open source activities throughout the IC. I think that's so interesting because it's an example of where uh, the structure of the intelligence community is very public, right? And, and much of this came from uh, recommendations from the WMD Commission Report back in 2005. Exactly. Uh, when we right. Yep. The I see 113. ICD 113. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And so I, I guess you know what's what's not clear to me is so is is Director Burns, you know, responsible for open source as a discipline in the intelligence community. And, and that could be just a, a question for the ether there, or Patrice, if you want to take, take a, a stab at it, or Helen, um, is that his job? He is responsible for all things that fall under the open source arena um, related to intelligence. And so from my, from my role and our role, um, we try to make sure that anything related to activities, again, we're focused primarily on data acquisition, collection, training, and tradecraft standards. Now, again, because of how this particular int is set up, it is set up in a distributed nature. Um, everybody has their own way that they can do open source because they didn't come together initially and set it up like the other ints, which makes it sometimes challenging because if everybody kind of can do their own thing, um, but still try to be under un one umbrella, it's a little bit hard because there's rain falling in under that umbrella, just like it is outside that umbrella. And it's just hard to keep everybody, you know, on the same page sometimes. However, I think one of the key focuses of making sure that the governance structure is working and healthy is to align all of the folks and the organizations in a direction that makes sense and that is beneficial to what we're trying to do for the mission. So um, again, that is one of our key goals is to try to get everybody aligned. What are the right types of data sources? How do we make sure that we are collecting the right things that um, meet the mission requirements? And also, how do we do that in a way that doesn't um, uh, affect uh, what we're trying to do from a uh, trade craft and training perspective. So there's con some consistency there and we can work together to try to deconflict all the different things. So everybody's not over overstepping each other or blending things or making things um, obvious when we're trying to really do something on behalf of what we're trying to do for the intelligence mission. Got it. Ellen, do you want to respond to that? And 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 Ellen, you know, if how much, how often would you think, you know, the senior leadership of a of an organization as big as you know CIA, how often do you think they think about open source and the health of open source on a day to day basis? And then respond to uh, Patrice's uh, remarks there. Well, I mean, this, that's a, that's a, what the hell? Um, <laughs> <laughs> he gave that one to well, you. <laughs> I, yes, Patrice, <laughs> you were supposed to get all the hard questions. Um, <laughs> so I will tell you, I have sort of my, my underlying theme has been is that we need leadership here. And I will tell you that, do I think that um, Director Burns is, is worried about is, is is worried about how we can better incorporate open source into the intelligence enterprise. Absolutely, but but I also know that he's overwhelmed with the day to day that comes from being the director of CIA. And I, I will tell you that I actually think um, that this is part of the challenge anyway. When I say we need leadership, we need consistent, focused, very senior leadership on this issue. Um, that you just don't get that with. Um, the appointment process where people come in for two or three years and then they rotate out. You know, I, I'll just throw this out there. I actually think we should follow sort of the FBI model. I don't think Intel directors should be political appointees. Um, we all, you know, the Intel community is Intel officers. We take an oath, it's truth to power, no matter who that power is. 
Um, I think I think FBI, the director is there for 10 years. Let's appoint people in as agency leads. And even if they are political, they're there for 10 years. And, and that's where you're, you're going to get the, the leadership and the focus that, that some of these big changes require. I mean, so, so we're talking about fundamentally changing the business model of the United States intelligence community. That's really what open source is all about. So during World War II and the Cold War, where we had to worry about protecting sources, we operated in secret, where where data that was acquired from national technical means was the only game in town. There was nothing out there in the private sector that could match the insights that we derived from national technical means and the tools and the people who assessed that data. That, that, that model has flipped. Using Amy Ziegert again, she, she, I quote her, that she assesses that roughly 80% of all information in today's intelligence reports are available through publicly available means. So the days of protecting secrets, not, not that protecting secrets is not important, but if 80% of your intelligence report can be derived from openly available information, maybe we need to focus on protecting that other 20% and not the 80% that's already out there. And so I will tell you that I think the days of protecting secrets are, it's still important, but it may not be our number one function. I think our number one function is delivering insights. I think the world of open source changes the intelligence community into being a content provider. And I think we're seeing this loud and clear with the war in Ukraine right now, where you know, the intel community is doing everything it can to um, declassify information that's probably not classified, but they're declassifying it and sharing it with the American people, sharing it with the world, and, and to great effect. I mean, not only is this getting to Putin, but it's also providing some insights to the American people, to the world, about what the intelligence community can do in the days where nobody trusts anything, at least these assessments coming out from the IC are providing some ray of hope, you know, that there is trusted insights. It's great for the IC brand, a great, it's great when we talk about IC transparency. And so you know, I think there's an opportunity here to build some momentum. You talk about the future. So let's look at it, it potentially changing the business model of the IC, you know, declaring that the role of the IC is to provide content that doesn't matter where you are in the organization, whether you're a collector, a resource person, an acquisition person, you are now assessed on your ability to deliver content. And I, and I think that's how you're going to start driving and incentivizing people to think of new ways and to, to move forward faster. And, and so I guess I'll just stop here because I could go on for another 10 minutes. But I, I, mean, I, think, that's, I think that's the opportunity of open source. Let's do another poll question to the audience. Uh, question two. Uh, this is based on the CSIS reporting. And we're going to list out uh, the top uh, obstacles, according to the CSIS reports, uh, to technology adoption and change uh, in open source and the intelligence community. And so audience, we would ask you uh, select the most pressing uh, challenge or problem here to solve, and we'll look at your responses in just a moment. Um, and, and Patrice, uh, while they're doing that, I'd also like to ask you, what do you think are the top challenges uh, facing community OSINT today? Uh I believe that the technology piece is not the hard part to me. It's uh, it's really just getting everybody to agree on the direction. Like Ellen said earlier, I think that there there is leadership that's trying to change things um, and push and and motivate and direct things in a, in, in a way that would be uh, hopefully a game changer. However, for me and being you know, in a world where I've been an IT chief and, uh, and looking at what we're doing from a technology perspective, um, making sure that we can manage, maintain, support, um, the infrastructure and the um, different uses of technology. And for me also, it's just having the individuals with the right skill set and the motivation to come in and really take on these challenging roles, um, especially in the federal government realm. Um, you know, this is, this is not always the easiest place to work. 
Um, it is not always, you know, um, the highest paid place to work, be honest. But um, it really, to me, like I said, I was a contractor for many years. I made the switch to staff because I really wanted to play a role in the decision-making process and be one of those folks that helped to, to drive change. And yeah. so for me, um, having individuals coming into the government to look at how you can support and add your expertise, training and motivation and creativity to what we're trying to do is really where I think we um, would see some really great strides. That's so well said. We have the, the passion and the brains, I think, on this call to make a difference. We do not have all the time. Uh, so I want to hit a couple uh, of topics here uh, that I think we just, you know, we owe it to the community to, to air out. Um, and maybe we won't get to the bottom of them, but I, I do want to at least raise them. Uh, and maybe uh, maybe our, our colleagues across the community will, will run with some of them. Um, Ellen, I want to read you another, another, uh, another statement. This one uh, is from uh, a different study on open source. Uh, it also actually comes from CSIS. Not that they are, you know, be all and end all, but they happen to have written a lot on this. Uh, I want to get your reaction to this statement, Ellen, because it gets to what Patrice is saying around change agents um, and where that change is coming from. And here's, a, here's the statement. It says, uh, the current IC and DOD ecosystem, which includes acquisition professionals, security standards, industries, creates a self-reinforcing culture. There's a security infrastructure that jealously protects what it does. The acquisition community is built on that and is resistant to change. Um, in other words, everyone currently in the system benefits from the stability of the system. Industry insiders have cracked the code and are profiting from the current situation. They don't have a disincentive to change. Security teams and acquisition chains gravitate toward the proven and the familiar. Thus, the pressure to change comes from the outside, particularly from smaller companies yelling in frustration at navigating the gates to entry. End of the quote. Antibodies come into the system for a new thing. What is, how does that make you feel? You know, I, well, I have to agree with the with the quote and and actually even even Patrice's description of sort of what the environment is as somebody who's come and gone. Um, you know, uh, I'll tell you that you know I would love to see data about sort of how numbers are looking in terms of people leaving the IC. I don't. I mean, when I when I was there, it was still pretty stable, but. Um, the reality is, is that, you know, you can get jobs that provide a mission focus, that provide more flexibility um, and are exciting in the private sector now. I mean, you know, the, my successor at INR, Brett Holmgren, was the CIO at, at Capital One. He protected his family's money. That's, that's a mission mm -hmm. focus. And he was able to do it in an environment where innovation and flexibility and worked with really smart people. And, you know, so it's, it's I, I think that the, I see has some competition from the private sector in terms of brain power. I think it's going to get worse. I don't think it's going to get better. Um, I'm going to I'm going to go back to my INR um, example, where another thing that sets it apart from analysts at CIA and DIA. So INR is one of the three all source and civilian intelligence organizations. Is that their analysts stay on average for 17 years in an area, which is about 15 years more than CIA and DIA on average. And the reason is, and they get paid less than their counterparts at CIA and DIA because they're not accepted service. So why is it they stay? Well, the reason they stay is because they're sitting with their customers. Self-actualization comes from actually delivering something and having somebody say this helped or this didn't, which is just not the way the business model works in the IC today. So, um, so getting to the, the, the quote and this sort of self-licking ice cream cone that the IC is right now, I think going to a new business model, I think, I think saying again, the job of the IC is to deliver content. You will be measured on your ability to deliver content. You as the acquisition professional will be, will be assessed on your ability to deliver capabilities that are gonna help deliver content. I mean, I think that would be a very strong message. It, it would be, it'll be tough 
but it would be, it's the kind of thing, it's that wild bill moment, it's the thing that has to change. And so it's not about degrading the role of security, which is incredibly important, but now security can focus on the stuff that it really needs to focus on, which is not the majority of things, of, of, of stuff. Um, so I, I mean, I'll just go back to that, you're right. I mean, I worked in a government where, when I was at NGA and the director was Tish Long, she'd get calls from contractors who were saying, hey, that latest RFI that went out is not even remotely close to the strategy that you just discussed at GEOINT. And, and, and so she would come back to me and say, what's going on, Ellen? And then I would have to go back and say, look, you know, what you're asking for is not what's wanted. And I'm not sure it's any different right now. So we need to do a major change, a major flip. And I know it's risky, but I think it's worth it um, in terms of providing a very clear guidepost for where we want to go as a community the, and then having someone in office for 10 years to get us there. Yes. Um, let's do poll question number three. Uh, and then I think we're going to have time for one more question for each Patrice and Ellen. Uh, poll question number three is without intervention, how hopeful are you, the audience, uh, that the IC will commit sufficient resources to OSINT to gain or to regain um, our Intel advantage? And you can use the Likert scale there uh, to select your answer. And while our audience is thinking about how hopeful they are, Patrice, let's go back to you. I have a number of audience questions, um, far more than we're going to be able to get to, unfortunately. <laughs> But several of them are around access to the community and access to the agency uh, for, for uh, private sector, especially when they have ideas. Here's one from Eric Olson. Uh, it says, uh, why is it so difficult to get access to engage the agency to demonstrate state-of-the-art platforms? And then Patrice, I would just ask you to add to that. Um, could you talk about some of the ways that you, you are engaging industry up and that you've seen you know, be successful? So this must be karma because I wrote down a note that I was going to come back to to address that exact thing. Um, again, just based on my kind of double, double dipping in the contractor side as well as the staff side, I can truly say that some of the benefits that I find um, and found uh, uh, as we uh, look at this landscape of open source is to engage more with our industry partners. We cannot do this without industry. And so one of the ways that we are looking to expand and grow and take advantage of new technologies is to partner with industry. And to do that, um, we need to make sure that industry understands what it is that we are trying to achieve um, and understands how we how they can get us there. Um, we want to. Um, this is a way for those that may not necessarily be interested in federal government service can still do mission centric support to the the country and to the intelligence mission. And oh, by the way, you'd have all the the other pieces, benefits, and some flexibility depending on your company. But the bottom line is industry and what industry brings to the federal government is our force multiplier. It is the way that we will be able to leverage and move faster than just federal government um, resources 100% of the time, at least um, uh, people, people resources. We need to partner and we'll continue to broaden our partnership with, with industry because we have to. Well said, Patrice. Uh, we are going to start wrapping up. We have so much passion here, uh, but we do uh, want to be respectful of folks' days. Uh, last thoughts for us uh, or insights as we, uh, as we wrap up here. I am excited about the future. I know that things are not um, as fast from a momentum perspective as I would like because I am one of those folks that I set a plan. I'm a plan. I'm a project program manager by by birth, like I said earlier. However, um, I really do believe that if everyone continues to engage and to uh, ensure that your 
leadership chains and the and the folks that you uh, communicate with, collaborate with, understand the value of open source, then we can all collectively start to send that wave of understanding that we have to make the changes, um, you know, that we have to make to make sure this becomes like we we mentioned earlier, the end of first. Um, resort. It is the place where everything starts now. And to do that effectively, we have to come together and figure out a way to do it right. Got it. Ellen, I'm going to turn it over to you uh, for your last thoughts. I, I do have one more question, which you can choose to answer or not. <laughs> um, you know, we've heard rumors uh, that the DNI is looking um, potentially to shake up open source. That certainly isn't a stretch to say that, you know, she, as a former co-chair of some of the reports that we just talked about, um, it wouldn't be a surprise if, if the community were to implement some of those recommendations, which some of which touched along the scale of what we're talking about today. What do you think comes next? Is it more the same or is it something really different? Um, and then your just your final thoughts for us, please. You know, I like Patrice, I'm incredibly optimistic. So this is something that the private sector cares about deeply. I mean, I think you're seeing across all business lines, there is concern. I mean, whether you're working cyber or you're working supply chain or you're worried about your kids and social media, I mean, it's just there, the momentum is building um, to actually work this misinformation, disinformation problem. And so much of it is a private sector issue that I think um, you know, again, this is my optimism that I think the private sector, as it, as it continues to focus on their real concern with um, how are we going to provide truthful and accurate sources of information? How are we going to get there? How are we going to teach our kids to be critical thinkers? What are the technologies that we need to assure that what we're seeing and reading is really what we're seeing and reading? And, mm -hmm. and there's so much focus on it. President Obama just talked about this a couple of days ago. We're just seeing so many people. Um, Elon Musk even buying Twitter, no matter what you think about this, it's clear that there is this focus. And so I, I do believe that, um, that the, the government will not you know, well, certainly is it just going to sit there and watch the private sector continue to press on this incredibly important subject. And so I am highly optimistic and I'm, I'm very glad to hear that the DNI is ready to move out on some of these things. She was involved in the study that actually laid out a path, a, a path looking forward. Um, but, you know, Matt, you know, you know I am a I, I'm I'm a risk taker and I would like to see some some major changes, some big some big changes. And. I, I just think we can't, iterative change is not gonna get us there. And so I am an optimist, but I think we need some, some sweeping change and some consistent leadership focus. Thank you for that. And thank you both uh, for talking with us uh, today. Suzanne, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Um, but I'm also gonna thank you uh, for your leadership of INSA and INSA uh, and for creating forums like this where we can explore intelligence issues. Uh, you know, the IC doesn't have the benefit like the defense community does of think tanks and academic research focused on um, on its betterment. Uh, and so I hope even if uh, the audience did not necessarily feel the same way uh, about everything today, that they at least agree that it's there's value in having these conversations outside the skip. So thank you for hosting us. And just on behalf of the INSA Foundation, uh, Patrice and Ellen, uh, thank you for the candid conversation. Matt, thank you for your support as well as Advantis. And then our partner Clearance Jobs as well. Um, I just wanna mention to everybody at the end of the webinar, there'll be a quick survey that pops up. I would encourage everyone to complete it. We do digest that information and hopefully you see that it is reflected in some of the speakers and topics that we will be addressing in the coming months. This concludes today's program. I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Thanks so much.